Hello and welcome back to part two of what I thought was going to be a, just a single video. Uh, but here I just want to talk very briefly about the terms uh, that we have been using in the class and that we've introduced into each module. And as well, uh, important because of what is going to be on the test. So let's do the terms first. Uh, first one, misinformation versus disinformation. Uh, important distinction, misinformation is simply incorrect, right? I misspoke. No one ever says I disspoke. Uh, I might have dissed someone, but misinformation is simply giving the wrong information and then correcting yourself. Disinformation is the intention to mislead and deceive, and that would be propaganda. And that's propaganda by any kind of political entity, whether it's an official government organization, it's some political party, but propaganda is the kind of disinformation that is intended to mislead or deceive the person who is the intended target. So those are two terms that are important. Uh, willful, willful ignorance. Uh, that is really, again, uh, relating back to Francis Bacon's uh, idols of the tribe, right? That's us, to be willfully ignorant. Um, the real enemy, right, is just not... Uh, not skepticism, in other words, not knowing, but simply false knowledge. And not only is this part of Bacon's um, Idols of the Tribe, but that's also um, Pierre Bale's, right? Hubris of certainty, right? That hubris of certainty, false knowledge that you are willfully ignorant because not only are you dead set on this being the correct order of the day or the correct interpretation, but you're not willing to entertain any new ideas. So you are willfully ignorant of facts that will contradict your position. So when we choose to insulate ourselves from new ideas, we're suffering from a kind of willful uh, or intentional in ignorance. I don't want to know the facts. And we've heard even worse, right? The effing facts and all the rest of it, but that's it. So willful ignorance is not only not knowing, but willing not to know, not to get a different idea. And the opposite of that would be skepticism. Uh, the backfire effect. Uh, this is when you uh, present facts to someone and instead of them changing their beliefs, the opposite happens, right? They double down. So it doesn't convince the subject uh, to change their false belief, their false knowledge, but it does in fact the opposite, right? They become even more entrenched. So again, this is willful ignorance. I don't want to hear facts. I want to stick to my ideological position. Another one is source amnesia. I'm just going to move this too, not too quickly. Um, this does happen. It certainly happens to me constantly, which is why I have to you know, write down information when I read it somewhere. Uh, but we tend to forget uh, where we read something. We remember the content, hopefully correctly, but we forget where we read it or heard it. And so both the backfire effect and source amnesia are important because if we are unable to locate and identify where we read or heard something, then we start to sort of embellish it and we can't go back to correct ourselves. So those two really work well in, uh, hand in hand in producing and maintaining, right? especially maintaining false information. Uh, skepticism, which is a term we have been uh, using quite a lot in the course. Um, it goes all the way back to Socrates and it is this desire to continually search for new answers, right? That continual search for truth, which, if anything, motivates all of the thinkers that we what we have already looked at and will be looking at in this course. So we respect the notion that there is some truth out there, again, truth in quotations, and as Lee McIntyre uh, described in his book, truth is a guiding ideal, right? It's not a destination. Because once you get there, again, you are fixed in your position. It's this and no other way. So the hubris of certainty, the willful ignorance, all of that kicks in. So if we can consider truth a kind of light that shines our way, uh, it is a, an ideal, right? Let's try to get the best version. And let's maybe through consensus achieve some desired uh, truth that we can all share. A uh, couple of other ones, motivated reasoning. That's when we find ourselves willing, maybe unconsciously, again, we're back to Bacon, right? Bacon got it right, right? We are willing to shade our beliefs, right? To, to um, 
change them in some way to sort of cherry pick the uh, the facts that are presented to us because we wanted to be able to reflect those previously held beliefs, right? These original ideas that we had. So we try to look for reasons to justify the beliefs we continue to hold, we already hold, and we would wish to hold in the future. So we don't want to look at facts. We want to, and if we are presented with them, we want to cherry pick them very carefully. And when we do this, we're also doing something that's otherwise called confirmation bias. Right? We are looking at something and we're just going to selectively pick those things that fit our narrative, right? fit the way in which we see the world. So motivated reasoning, confirmation bias essentially mean the same thing and they certainly motivate us in the same way. And in the last one here, um, there are two versions of ideology that we will look at in the first half of this, uh, this term. Uh, the first one is the one that we looked at with uh, with Condillac and especially with Tracy, uh, ideology as the science of the creation of ideas. And there's a police or cruiser or fire truck going by, so ignore that, everything's good. So ideology here, it's um, the way in which we form a kind of consciousness about the world, right? It's a mental faculty, it's, a, it's part of how we create ideas. But what happens is in ideology, we tend to have the capacity to explain, right? To flatten out contradictions. Uh, and we do this on this theoretical level, right? This is where Marx comes in. He says, yeah, we work out these problems on a theoretical level and they never reflect back in the real world. And that therein lies the problem, right? With ideology. So it distorts, right? It distorts the situation to the degree where we think we've solved it, but we've only solved it theoretically. So ideology is a negative and restricting concept because the moment, moment in which we think we've figured things out, we now become entrenched in that position that once again, right, this is the way it is and it cannot be any other way. So it distorts our capacity to fix something. We're not looking at it from the ground up. We're looking at it in a sense from the top down. And if we see that there is a discrepancy, a contradiction, a, a disconnect, we try to fix the idea rather than the actual material conditions that cause the contradiction. So it also helps to cover over errors and distortions. And yes, they can be overcome by criticism, right? And skepticism and, and a, uh, a healthy disbelief. But we wanna make sure that we're always doing it from the ground up, right? Moving from the actual situation and moving up to a theory that might reflect Right? Re might actually reflect what's going on. Because what often happens is when you approach something with a theory already preconceived, that's a kind of ideology, right? Because it's a preconceived notion. You really aren't seeing the situation as it really is. And so rather than go to the situation and work your way out and create something that will reflect more effectively the conditions that you are, dis you, you are studying or discussing, if you come at it with preconceived theories, you're not going to be able to see it properly. And that ultimately is an ideolo ideological position. Okay, the last thing I wanted to mention too is the actual uh, shape of the, of the test because I did mention in class last week when we met that I was going to change it. So the, the test is actually in two parts and uh, we'll, we'll talk about it more when we see each other next week. But uh, I just want to say that it's in two parts. The first, uh, well, both sections cover modules two through to six. And the first section is called Identify and Explain. And very simple for each response, briefly explain one, what the term means, two, its significance in the course material, and three, the thinkers or theorists that are associated with the term. Now, in certain cases, uh, that term may have more than one uh, theorist or thinker attached to it. So what I'm thinking here is all kinds of words like willful ignorance and motivated reasoning, ideology, uh, scholasticism, uh, the scientific method, um, deception, superstition, uh, what is a virtuous atheist. Um, all of these things are terms that we've used. So. I'm looking for you to be comfortable using those terms both in your discussion in class, in raising questions, but also in your essay. 
So rather than sort of uh, trying to describe something, just use those terms. So uh, all of those are important and useful. Uh, the only one that you need to be careful of is the term ideology. If I have it in the identify and explain, I will identify which one I'm looking for you to explain. So those are the kinds of ideas that uh, in the first part, identify and explain. The second part, also some choices. There will be five essay questions that reflect the five modules that we have looked at so far, but I want you to only answer three. So the first part will be worth 30 marks that I'm looking for you to answer 10 out of, there's about 25 different terms. Again, only answer 10. Don't forget it. if you start the test and go, oh my God, did he say five, 10, all of them? The instructions are there. I'm just letting you know ahead of time. But in the second part, there are five essay questions, but answer only three. And of those, there will be there'll be one sort of a general question on each of the modules. Now, the last thing I want to end with here is because of the way I've structured this course, uh, the essay part, right, the research report in particular, the first part, which is due in a couple of weeks, is the research proposal. And then a few weeks after that, I'm looking to see a, a rough draft, or at least a first draft, with some ideas worked out. And then the final part, at the end of November, beginning of December, somewhere in there, uh, depending on our time uh, plays out, uh, the final report. So having said that, uh, I, would, I don't mind you looking ahead to the second half of the course, because I was also thinking of the way in which you could look ahead and at least get some ideas in terms of the second half and I thought perhaps you could look at Nietzsche's uh, view of language, this notion that uh, we are kind of lying to ourselves in being authority figures and being authoritative and objective. Nietzsche doesn't believe we can do that. And that language has, has that slippery quality that is somehow is always evasive. Now, you could, you could match that up with uh, Tracy's notion of ideology. If that's the case, if the way in which we form, we formulate theories and ideas and we we disseminate them, right? we speak out loud with other people. How does that factor into Nietzsche's notion that language is slippery, that it always evades us, right? Can we can we uh, come to a to uh, an either a comparison or a contrast or at least some balance between these two ideas? That's one of them. Uh, another one would be Max Weber's charismatic authority. Uh, compare that or contrast that with Bacon's uh, Idols of the Cave because that is, uh, again, our upbringing, our education, what we consider to be authority figures, right? So now you can take something from the first half of the course and match it up to something in the second half. You could also look at Hannah Arendt's notions of totalitarianism and look at Plato's noble lie or even um, Guy Debord's Society of the Spectacle. Uh, Again, I'm not saying you cannot. Please absolutely do look ahead because there could be some things that if you're not quite sure, might kind of really strike a chord and you say, yeah, I want to follow this up. So we've got Hannah Arendt, uh, Plato's Noble Lie, the Boas Society of the Spectacle, or you could look at totalitarianism and the Frankfurt School's notions of uh, false prophets. You could also match that up to Max Weber's charismatic authorities because they essentially are talking to the same people. And then also uh, Bacon's Idols of the Tribe, uh, Mar Marx's ideology is sort of a reverse of reality, an upside down version of reality. And again, De Beau's Society, the spectacle. Um, there are lots of opportunities for you to look ahead to the second half, kind of dig around. And uh, that's why the, I've left the slides open for you to look at. But take a look to see if may maybe you can do that. Look at something in the first half and uh, marry it up with something from the second half. You don't have to, but I'm saying that you can do that. That's an option. Okay, so hopefully this has helped. Uh, this is the second half of a two-parter. The first half being a breakdown of the modules. Second half, uh, a quick look at the terms, a few more ideas for the, for the upcoming essay or the research report, and then also a breakdown of what the, uh, what the test is all about and the, the, the form that it's going to take. So thank you very much for watching, and I will uh, hopefully be seeing you soon uh, back in the classroom. So take